So good evening all. On behalf of IRA Kerala, I welcome all the residents and consultants to this PG case presentation series on gastrointestinal tract in connection with Genomet. I extend my welcome to Dr. Gomadi Subramaniam, President IRA Kerala, Dr. Rijo Matthew, Secretary IRA Kerala, and Dr. Ramesh and I, Program Coordinator. Heartily welcome to Dr. Rajesh Kannan, Professor Amrita Institute of Medical Science, Kochi, who is going to be the coordinator or the moderator of the session today. And also welcome the residents, Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Prashant, and Dr. Juhu. I welcome once again to all the <coughs> attendees. And now over to Gomadi Madam for opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Venu, who is our academic chairman of Kerala IRIA. I'm very happy to see that the program is going in a very smooth way and wonderful, seeing a lot of cases. And the students are so much benefited by seeing each case because this month we are doing GIT and they have seen uh, the last week. And, uh, they, and nearly I feel they have seen a lot of cases where they, they won't see in the department also. So I'm feeling so happy that all the students are enjoying our academic feast uh, and which will be very useful for the examination. So I request all the attendees uh, to be live and alert during the academic session because it's a wonderful teaching session which is always asked for the examination. Thank you and I welcome all of you. Over to you, Dr. Rajesh. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so uh, thank you, IRA, uh, Kerala team. So, uh, without wasting time, we'll uh, move on to the first case presentation. Uh, is uh, Dr. Aswin? You can start. You can unmute. Share your screen. Yes, Aswin. You can start sharing your screen. Aswin, can you unmute? Uh, is there any? Aswin, can you unmute? Uh, I think it's. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He has to share the screen. Yeah. Can you uh, share the screen like you did last time? Can I start? No, no, not possible. Uh, Yes, it's coming. Yes, Hope the uh, participants, uh, if so they have any queries, please click history. Uh, uh, no, it, lady, still images issues, are not seen. Aswin, uh, abdominal pain and altered bowel habits uh, with history of anorexia and weight loss. There is Aswin, we are not seeing the images. Can you stop share and uh, share it again? There are some. Uh, yeah, it was opening no earlier. I'm getting yeah. disconnected in between, sir. Okay. Uh, if there is any delay, then we will move on to the next uh, one. It says a double click to enter full screen mode. I think we'll 
go to the uh, second one dr zuhu are you ready Uh, so see uh, no still there were screen under. screen is not seen uh, let you click once more please click it once more you will get it somia can you help him somia are you there online here only i think some network issues Uh, so if he has the, let the other uh, resident take charge who's the other resident uh who also another yes uh, prasant can you start then ah uh, yes sir i am ready sir yeah okay, okay. you start you start Let's start okay i should you try okay yeah we we'll, can do next yeah prasant is coming yes can you go to this side yeah, yes yeah? yes yes very good very good yeah yes you can start is it all right can i start yes yes, yes I just would like to wish the faculty a good evening and a good evening to all my colleagues. Uh, I'm Dr. Prashant Rajan, uh, one of the PGs at uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi, and uh, this is my case presentation. Uh, so my case is uh, a 67-year-old lady. She initially present with complaints of abdominal pain, abdominal distension, constipation, and breathlessness. She had abdominal pain and abdominal distension for quite some time. with uh, with uh, with a sudden onset of breathlessness and and the abdominal pain had also become more severe and in like an acute onset this is a personal history she had altered bowel habits she had no fever or chills no history of trauma and normal sleep habits on her clinical examination when she had come to the uh, uh, to the er the patient had a tender abdomen and her general condition was poor she was disoriented but her vitals were stable she had no pallor ictus clubbing lymphadenopathy um palpation uh, her abdomen was soft there was no palpable mass but there was abdominal distension on percussion there was no fluid thrill or shifting dullness indicating this unlikely that the abdominal distension was due to fluid on auscultation her bowel sounds were sluggish so a chest x ray was advised and it was taken so i would like to start to discuss about this chest x ray uh so this is a pa view it's uh, well centered well exposed and uh, if we can see here um uh the mediastinum is shifted towards the left and also this lung field in the middle and lower lung field there is an opacity that is in that region and if you look at the density of that opacity it is less than bone and less than the cardiac silhouette but more than the air that you see in the lung and also if you can see you can see the vessels the pulmonary vasculature is seen through the or it can be seen also overlapping the uh, respective area also uh, we, as as we can see this the the contour of the right hemi diaphragm is not seen separately and on the left side we can we can actually see the contour this is the contour on the left side and there is gross mediastinal shift with along with trachea and the cardiac shadow and another finding is that the cardiac silhouette is not appreciated the right side the right heart border is not appreciated normally it should be in this area so can you see the arrow sir is the arrow visible yes okay yes okay so normally uh, the right heart border is supposed to be here but we are not able to see it separately and even the paraspinal line is also not properly seen uh so can i move on to the next slide then or should i wait for uh, someone no, to no uh, no with this uh, you should be able to say what is your uh, interpretation i will interpret okay. this okay. you describe yeah. the finding so i will interpret this okay sir so um as i described uh, this area uh, the density is uh, uh, more than the uh, less than the bone and the cardiac silhouette but then more than the uh, air in the lungs so this is likely it could be a fat density lesion first of uh, all you have to locate the lesion where is it uh, then you can go to the pathology it is in the in the mid and uh, lower uh, lung zones okay so yeah. first thing what will you uh, the, the, in the location yeah that is the zone you are talking about but when you are coming to the location so first thing you have to say whether it is in the mediastinum or in the lung yes sir ha uh, uh, it's the mediastinal opacity or lung opacity 
Uh, no, sir, it's not a lung opacity because we can see the pulmonary vasculature that we're going through. It's so most likely it will uh, it'll be, it can be a mediastinal opacity or something arising from even, uh, can be some, because since we are having elevation of this uh, or like uh, we're not able to see the right uh, diaphragm diaphragmatic contour, mm -hmm. it also be some abdominal pathology that is causing an elevation or that is going into the mediastinum. Okay. It is not no, unlikely to be a lung pathology. Uh and uh, you are not also not seeing any air bronchogram and we are not uh, seeing any yeah uh, and it's a uh, no, broad base we are not seeing the uh, you know uh, the medial border as well as the lateral border clearly so it can be a okay mediastinal lesion so when you say mediastinum which mediastinum um, so if you are saying mediastinum this could be either uh, this because the paraspinal line and cardiac silhouette is uh, not seen so this could be uh, middle or posterior mediastinum uh heart border not seen means uh middle, right heart border right heart border not seen means it is in the, yeah middle. anterior uh, anterior or middle uh, okay because uh, um, uh, the, the, the for a first year mediastinum generally will go with the descending aorta so the right heart border means it has to be the middle lobe no? right middle lobe which will be the in contact with the uh, um, uh, right heart border Okay, yeah. so generally anything closer to the, uh, the middle lobe, so that means in the anterior mediastinum or middle mediastinum. Okay, yeah. So then, with the opacity, the density of the opacity. So what are all the possibilities? Um, so if we're having a, a this kind of fat density, we could be thinking of a germ cell tumor. We mm. could be thinking uh, of uh, an angiomyolipoma of the liver that is uh, that is uh, causing an elevation of this left hemidiaphragm. Hmm. Uh, we could be thinking of a HC, a fat containing HCC. Okay. Um, uh, and also, but and this, since this is a, a an erect PA view, we can't really think of pulmonary abscess because then we are not seeing the airflow level. But if the patient is lying supine, then uh, since the fluid will be uh, uh, will be will coat the the entire area, so this could it could cause a homogeneous opacity like this also. Hmm. But since we are having a, an, a, an erect x-ray we can't say that it is a pulmonary abscess okay. um, and then uh, yes yeah, so these are the and also it could be it could be any sort of uh, a hernia of uh, a uh, like a, con a diaphragmatic hernia can also cause something like this okay so one important thing is yeah whenever you see a opacity and you should be able to uh, you know compare it with the normal uh, opacities uh, which is there in the you know uh, whatever uh, visible structures so uh, for example you, know, you can compare it with the liver you can compare it with the heart soft tissue bone okay so always you have to say whether it is more than the bone less than the bone or more than the liver and all here as you rightly pointed out it is uh, more than the soft tissue and uh, less than the uh, uh, air so uh, i mean more loosened than the uh, soft tissue uh, but less loosened than the air so you are thinking of a fat containing lesion as one possibility it's okay so then you can think of a you know, different dds and you told some vessels are seen through that no uh, so do you think that are all normal pulmonary vessels or uh, the 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 course of the vessels are little unusual See the, the course of the vessel, especially the one medial one uh, through the opacity which is going down, uh, that are all is you know, very unlikely to be a normal pulmonary vasculature. No? So that means it may be some other you know, uh, vessel. Okay. Yeah. So that is what uh, you have to you know, think of. Someone is saying, you know, is it a hilum overlay sign is positive? Yes sir. So can we say it is hilum overlay sign positive? Um, yeah, uh, yes sir. It, 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 it. No, but the thing is you are not seeing the definite hilum. Okay, so mm -hmm. what you are seeing that uh, the vessel like thing does not look like a normal hilum. Okay, so that is a little unusual. Okay, yeah, so basically with this x-ray what you can say is it is can be the lesion uh, located in the right uh, you know, cardiophrenic angle. Uh, you know, maybe containing uh, you know, fat or mixture of uh, air and the soft tissue. Uh, right CP angle is blunted which suggests maybe some uh, pleural effusion. Uh, so, if it is a fat containing lesion, yeah, as you told it can be either a teratoma, lip, you know, lipoma, um, uh, these are all the common things or if it is a air containing, uh, it can be either an, an mm -hmm. abscess, laculated, you know, hydronemothorax, laculated uh, pleural, uh, I mean hydronemothorax uh, or hydronemo pericardium, very unusual to have it on the, you know, uh, uh, so much eccentric. So, it can be a laculated hydronemothorax is one of the you know, DDs and uh, of course uh, hernia diaphragmatic hernia containing bowel can be a dd 
okay with this uh, okay yes sir. move on uh, so these are the findings uh, that we already previously mentioned yes okay uh, so should i should i just go over the findings again before yeah next no no yeah move on next uh, so this is a lung window a ct mm -hmm. axial axial ct taken with the lung window showing uh, the respective area so here we can see that there is air um an, an air fluid or air soft tissue level that we're able to appreciate over here so this can give us a rise to other dds like uh, as you previously mentioned sir, like pulmonary abscess or a loculated uh, hydronumothoraxin um this could also lead to other dds or and, and even also uh, the diaphragmatic hernia can also still be part of the differential uh, because any sort of uh, perforation and all can also lead to air coming into the hernial sac yes and uh, the previous findings are still standing still uh, the media center is shifted to the left and also this uh, the lower lung fields are taken over by this uh, elevation okay next so uh, these are my uh, differential diagnosis that i've uh, uh, previously mentioned so uh, as we said like pulmonary abscess cell tumor angiomyolipoma in liver fat containing hcc uh, lipoma in liver large hepatic adenoma and a hernia and also paralysis of the diaphragm can also lead to uh, uh, a non uh, asymmetrical elevation of one side of the diaphragm compared to the other side yes yeah next uh, so now this is a soft tissue window of uh, an axial ct of the mediastinum uh, now as we can see the respective area that we are seeing we can see that it is containing fat uh, most likely omentum because there are omental vessels also there is uh, an area of, of uh, fluid that is also present with the air also present so since omentum is coming into uh, the now can you can you trace can you show the next images yes so with uh, that again only we can say as a fat containing lesion no yeah so um, here we can see there is a defect in the right hemi diaphragm uh, with omentum going into the hemithorax but everything is getting pulled up the entire uh, contents of the abdomen is getting pulled up uh, in, so all the large bowel that is supposed to be in the paracolic gutter has also come into this area and uh, it is causing everything to get shifted up into the uh, into the upper part of the abdomen and also the the omentum has gone into the uh, uh, the hemithorax the right hemithorax through this defect to this pretty narrow, narrow defect it measures up approximately 1.4 centimeters uh, i'll go to the next image sir. yes uh, now we can see this is an ax axial section and soft tissue or uh, a soft tissue window of the structures in the abdomen uh, there is a large amount of free air that is present in the uh, uh, peritoneal cavity so this could possibly indicate uh, like a complication like a rupture or a perforation of bowel which is leading to uh, this amount of free air this also correlates with the history that we have given um, with uh, uh, the 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 67 year old lady she had sudden onset acute onset of increase in abdominal pain before she was having abdominal pain but suddenly she presented with severe abdominal pain so that would probably be like some sort of complication that occurred in uh, uh, with her condition so uh, so these are my findings what i have said previously um, so CT is a very definitive uh, diagnostic modality, especially when it comes to this kind of uh, when it comes to this kind of case. Uh, we can clearly see what are the contents in the right hemithorax, and also we can differentiate uh, between many of the differential diagnoses that uh, we have given previously, such as the angiomyolipoma. Uh, even between angiomyolipoma and fat-containing HCC, also you can see like angiomyolipoma will have a hepatic vein draining it, while HCC will be supplied by hepatic artery. So all these things we can clearly see on CT. And also we can see the defect that is there that has occurred in the right hemithorax, which has caused the momentum to go into uh, the mediastinum. Uh, yeah, do you have any other images? Uh, uh, no, sir, those are only Okay, fine. Images. Yeah, somebody is asking, uh, how can you uh, explain the vessel uh, like thing, what you have seen on a chest X-ray? Uh, yes, sir, those vessels could uh, or could like could even be omental vessels also yeah so you can confirm uh, it on a ct you can confirm that... it on the ct i can just go back to the image these are all these small uh, yeah, these these are like there to are be, some uh, more images there i think you didn't include that so it actually showed the mesenteric vessels 
going into that. So, uh, the, those are all the things you know, is it able to pick it up on an x-ray wise, yeah, it is not possible to explain every time, but uh, you know, correlating with the CT, then you should know that, yeah, so these are all the, uh, yeah, you can, uh, you know, here in the coronal, you can see some of the, you know, vessels. These are some vessels that yeah, are going in into that, yes, okay, fine. Yeah, you can move on, you can go to the discussion. Uh, yes, sir, as I previously said, uh, CT provides a definitive diagnosis. It is given uh, uh, the location of the hernial sac and also the defect is clearly appreciated. As I said pre previously also, differential diagnosis can be clearly diagnosed on CT and liver lesions can also be diagnosed on multi-phase, triple-phase CT. Another easy way to give this diagnosis or confirm the diagnosis, you can just insert a nasogastric tube and then you can take an X-ray film. Nasogastric tube will have a radio opaque line if uh, if you, if it, uh, if the stomach is part of the contents of the hernia you can just see that the nasogastric tube will be in the uh, mediastinum and even if you put a nasojejunal tube also if the tube is in the jejunal loop the loops that get herniated uh, you can see that the tube is going to be present in the uh, mediastinum this is another way to confirm the uh, diagnosis and uh, now describing the CT findings. So the defect is in the anteromedial aspect of the right hemidiaphragm, which is uh, differentiated to the counterpart of uh, the diagnosis, which is pogledax hernia, which is a puro peritoneal defect seen on the posterior lateral part. Uh, the air fluid level uh, in the sac can lead to misdiagnosis, as we said, as hydropneumothorax and on chest X ray. And uh, these uh, diaphragmatic hernias, they are usually asymptomatic. They can even present uh, for quite some time unless they lead to a complication which has occurred most likely in uh, in this uh, uh, present scenario because as I said, she had sudden acute onset of increasing abdominal pain. Likely it was due to a perforation that happened, which is also leading to the free air. So this person would actually come on an emergency basis to the ER. So usually either it's diagnosed uh, incidentally on a normal when you do a CT for something else or when a complication such as this occurs, it is also definitely diagnosed. And she was treated on an emergency basis. She was taken in for an emergency operation. Um, so these are the complications that can occur in uh, diaphragmatic hernia. Diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, there can be strangulation. Since there is a very small defect, uh, uh, there can be uh, strangulation of the bowel loops or there can be obstruction of the bowel loops. Ob a common uh, ways to identify if there is strangulation or obstruction, you can see even in this present case, there was free fluid in the hernial sac. But also you can also look at the opacification of the omental vessels. So there was there was pretty good opacification of the amental vessel, so it's unlikely to be uh, a strangulation, more likely to be an obstruction. A strangulation can also lead to the gangrene of bowel loops. It doesn't have to necessarily mean that only the bowel loops in the hernial sac can become gangrenous. It can cause uh, even uh, uh, bowel loops that are outside of the hernial sac to become gangrenous because as what happened here is that uh, the obstruction caused uh, proximal dilatation of the previous uh, large colon that caused it to perforate. And yes, yeah. Uh, can you can you enumerate the uh, surgical findings? Do you have any other slide? Uh, what happened to that case? Uh, uh, so surgical findings, uh, the, uh, sir. They didn't. They they just did a. They didn't. It was. Uh, I can tell you, sir. I actually. Yeah. Basically, yeah. This was uh, someone is asking what was why there was a free air. Uh, so it is uh, basically due to the uh, perforation of the bubble and uh, they did an emergency laparotomy after the uh, scan and uh, they found there is a perforation in the cecum probably due to the with a lot of additions uh, in the uh, hernial herniated area so probably there was an obstruction and uh, leading to the uh, over distension and perforation of the colon so that's why there is a free air okay so and some uh, there is uh, somebody at, uh, saying that there the, the dd on chest x ray wise it can be a ruptured hydatid cyst yes that also can be considered as a, since a very rare yeah so that is the last slide yes sir this is the last slide. yeah so thank you thank you prasant uh, so nice uh, presentation uh, so we'll move on to the uh, next one uh, can you stop sharing your screen okay thank you sir. ashwin if you are ready you can start again Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, the teaching point of this uh, case is uh, you should know the uh, DD for the right cardiophrenic angle opacity and uh, you should always look at the density of the lesion, uh, now whether it contains soft tissue density, water density, fat density or air density. Even though on x-ray wise you cannot differentiate soft tissue density and the water density, but you can differentiate between water, fat and the air. So, based on that you can you know, give the DDs. 
and uh, remember one of the dd for a right cardiophrenic angle uh, opacity is the margagni hernia which is different from the uh, bactola hernia which will be on the left side and the posterior whereas margagni hernia will be on the right side and anterior okay so these are all the important uh, teaching points you can uh, learn from this uh, case we'll move on to the next case yes as we can start mm. good evening everyone i am here presenting a uh, interesting case of anorexia in a young female so a 24 year old lady has a diffuse abdominal pain and altered bowel habits where she has history of anorexia and weight loss and there is no history of fever vomiting or jaundice ct abdomen with oral and iv contrast was done so this is the ct this is a ct abdomen uh, axial ct of the abdomen after giving oral and iv contrast here we can see the um, stomach is closely distended and the large bowel the large bowel loops are filled with fecal matter and they are distended and uh, there is mild fibrofatty proliferation and prominent vasorector in the basin tree then uh, they come down here towards the rectum there is a there is a communication between the rectum and the vagina and the contra positive contrast is seen leaking into the vagina so a diagnosis of a rectovaginal fistula was made and with possibility of uh, inflammation in the bowel yeah but uh, the major uh, disadvantage of uh, this was uh, done uh, some time back uh, uh, originally so where uh, when you are suspecting an inflammatory bowel disease uh, you know, actually you should not give a positive contrast because uh, what is the disadvantage positive of giving contrast. a positive contrast in a suspected ibd you won't uh, you won't see the um, mucosal details sir. yeah so you won't be able it's to assess the mucosal bowel. enhancement yeah. you know which will be one of the early finding of the inflammatory bowel disease so that can be completely missed so uh, you know that is a bit disadvantage but the advantage of uh, the oral contrast when you are suspecting a fistula then uh, it may be very useful so in this case because yes. there was a clinical suspicion of a fistula so oral contrast was uh, given and it clearly showed a there is a rectovaginal uh, fistula okay yes sir. Yeah, move on. And later, later a sigmoidoscopy was also done and was suggested a possible rectovaginal fistula. Then patient was medically managed as IVD and was put on follow up. So uh, later then she couldn't afford the treatment and she sought medications after about one year. And after another year, she presented again with anorexia, weight loss, and fatigue. And this time a CT andrography study was done. Uh, Aswin, what is the difference between the Aswin? Abdomen. Aswin, what is the difference between CT yes, enterography and the CT enteroclysis? Do you know? The enteroclysis, uh, yeah, uh, after inserting an uh, NG tube, will give the. Yes. Yeah. Whereas in enterography, it will be a uh, no, a patient will be taking orally. Uh, the, uh, the contrast whatever uh, we are giving positive contrast or a neutral contrast when you say enteroclysis is very very important term uh, all the you know, residents should know so when you say enteroclysis means uh, we will be putting a special tube uh, uh, do you know the name of the tube so you have to uh, put a special uh, the uh, naso uh, j uh, 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 jejunal tube it's not the nasogastric tube that tube has to be where should be the tip of the tube has to be you know, crossing the duodenum and it has to cross the dj junction and uh, it has to be on the left side so you have to keep it almost in the proximal jejunum then uh, you know, will be giving a uh, the uh, neutral contrast mixed with the methyl cellulose and all so that will get a good uh, distance of the uh, bowel so that is called the ct enteroclysis Whereas, if you give a oral uh, an, uh, a, a contrast, that is called the enterography. Okay, can go ahead. Yes. yes. So this is a CT enterography of the abdomen after giving for a neutral contrast, and here you can see uh, multiple areas of uh, mucosal enhancement along the mesenteric border with prominent vascular rectae and fibrofatty proliferation. and there are segments of uh, luminal narrowing and 
Kundal narrowing with strictures. Yeah, and can you show can you show that, that again? Once again, I think there is a small lag between what you are talking and what you are showing, so we can go a little slowly. Yes, because these are all very important. Can yes, you show yes. that uh, areas of enhancement under the structure? Yes, yeah. Yes, yes sir. Please. Yes, sir. This uh, mural enhancement uh, along the mesenteric border, sir. And here there is a structure, and this is a prominent vas erecti. There are prominent vas erecti. Then, as we go on, we can see that the uh, fistula is still persisting. And then the coronal image the structures are more clearly seen. And here you can see a structure uh, with mural enhancement. Here there's a luminal narrowing with mural enhancement. And you can see the prominent vasarecti and pro proliferation of mesenteric fat. So, uh, histopathology was done after endoscopy, so as to the inflammatory granulation tissue. Then our main DDs based on these findings will be transdisease and intestinal TB. Uh, it's uh, extremely difficult to distinguish between these two diseases, but we have some pointers which makes the diagnosis a bit more uh, easier. So you can the by involvement, the site of involvement in Crohn's ileum is more involved, commonly involved than cecum. And the cell TB, the cecum, and the elliptical wall are more commonly involved. Then length of the involvement, it's usually long segment involvement in Crohn's, as TB is short segment involvement. Then skip lesions and fistulae are more common in Crohn's. And uh, structures in Crohn's can be eccentric with circulations or pseudo circulations, whereas in TB, it's usually concentric. And uh, interbowel fistulae and increased mesenteric vascularity and fibrofatic proliferation are, are most commonly seen in Crohn's. Then uh, when it comes to mesenteric nodes, large necrotic mesenteric nodes are usually seen in TB, whereas in Crohn's, the lymph nodes are usually small and homogeneous. And uh, in TB, you can also see ascites. Then, uh, how to uh, identify an affected bowel versus a collapsed bowel? So, uh, when you look at an affected bowel, there will be abnormal enhancement, and you can compare it to the adjacent bowel segment, and there will be proximal bowel dilatation if there is a structure. And you can also look at the adjacent mesenteric changes. So for this particular case, three years later, uh, she again presented with perianal mass. Physical examination revealed a fleshy growth in the right lateral vaginal wall. MRI pelvis with contrast was done. The sagittal detuvated image. And you can see this is the uh, anterior rectum. You can see a fistulous communication with the vagina. You can also see an ISO2 uh, hypoindens mass involving the vaginal region. And that fistula is communicating with that mass and the anterior rectum. This is the uh, sagittal, uh, sorry, axial fat set image. And still see the communication, fistulous communication and the fungating sympathetic mass. The coronal titivated image is the fistulous communication between the vaginal wall and the mass. Uh, this is a sagittal post contrast image. It's in an enhancing mass with fistulous communication between the mass and the antidirectum. Yeah, in this, uh, you can clearly see that uh, it is not involving the rectum or the anal canal. Clearly, it is arising from the vaginum and the vulva 
uh, region uh, okay so that is a bit unusual yeah okay Uh, she and underwent wide local excision of the vaginal wall lesion and biopsy from the fistulous tract. And histopath came as well differential adenocarcinoma with neoplastic infiltration of the fistulous tract. So, uh, malignancy in Crohn's disease. Uh, what are the uh, sites of involvement? An area of long standing inflammation and disease. That is the issue the most common site. Or a surgically bypassed bowel, uh, which is less common as uh, bypass surgery for Crohn's is rarely done these days. And cytofistulae, which is it's rare, but that is what happened in our case. Yeah, so when we are talking uh, inflammatory like, bowel disease under the risk of uh, malignancy, it is more common with the ulcerative colitis. So uh, it's uh, yes, uh, that common in uh, Crohn's disease. So, more common in ulcerative colitis uh, with the uh, you know, uh, CA rectosigmoid is a very well known uh, entity. And uh, this is a case is a uh, you know, little unusual um, uh, because it was uh, you know, uh, uh, more sort of a Crohn's disease. Um, and the other thing is the uh, malignancy usually occurs within the bowel, uh, very unusual along the uh, uh, you know, fistulous tract. So, this is uh, the was you know, occurring well away from the bubble, also is a little unusual. Okay. Yes, sir. So, the, uh, we will be discussing few slides about the technique of CT andrography. So, we are performing it by passively distending the bubble lips with neutral contrast agents. The neutral contrast agents that we use are water, polyethylene glycol, volume, and uh, it is low density barium in sorbitol. We also use osmotic agents like mannitol, sorbitol, polyethylene glycol, which improves the bowel distension. So, this is the procedure. So, we prepare by diluting 300 ml of mannitol in 1500 ml of water, which is ingested by the patient for in one hour, and then the patient is scanned. So, the patient ingests, ingests 450 ml 60 minutes prior to the scan, another 450 ml 40 minutes before the scan. Then 225 ml, 20 and 10 minutes before the scan. Then the la uh, lastly, uh, patient just 250 to 300 ml on table just prior to the scan. So IV contrast is uh, given at 4 ml per second, and scan is done at a single venous phase at 70 seconds, or dual phase with late arterial at 30 and venous at 70 seconds. So we'll be discussing a few imaging. Go back. Go back that slide. Go back that slide. Yeah, see, this is again very important. Uh, the uh, manital preparation. Can you go back? Yes. So uh, now everyone should know how to use manital uh, no, enterography. Uh, so because generally we uh, usually uh, give only the uh, uh, positive uh, contrast, like a dilute uh, barium or a dilute uh, iodinated uh, contrast. Uh, but when you are suspecting an inflammatory bowel disease, uh, we have to do a CT uh, um, enterography. Uh, so, one of the simple way is giving a water is one of the uh, you know, neutral contrast, uh, where, uh, but the problem of the uh, water is usually it, you will not get a good uh, distension of the small bowel. Uh, so, uh, better will be a manitol, uh, so and you should know how to dilute it and how much to give and what time to give. So, these are all uh, both practically important as well as in the exam also it can be asked how to do the manital enterography. So, I request everyone to take a screenshot and uh, remember this. Okay, next. Yes, sir. Uh, we discuss a few imaging findings in Crohn's disease. So, it can be divided into the luminal and extra luminal. The luminal ones are mural hyperenhancement. Uh, which can be asymmetric, stratified, or homogeneous. So, in this case, you can see uh, a neural enhancement along the mesenteric border with relative sparing of the anti-mesenteric side. Huh? So, it's an asymmetric neural enhancement. In this case, you can see stratified neural enhancement with wall thickening. That is the enhancement along the inner and outer border with the uh, sub subserosa sparing. So, homo in this case, the walls are homogeneously enhanced. 
these are the three types of neural enhancement then wall thickening wall thickening we divided into mild moderate and severe uh, with 3 to 5 mm is mild more than 5 to 9 mm is moderate and more than 10 mm is severe structure we define the structure as a bowel segment with luminal narrowing and more than or equal to 3 cm dilatation of the upstream bowel segment and luminal narrowing is defined as luminal diameter reduction at least 50% compared to the adjacent normal bowel here we can see a structured segment with dilatation of the proximal loop same thing here a structured segment with dilatation of the proximal loop then another feature is ulceration is a break in the endothelial surface with extension of the contrast into the bowel wall here you can see the post uh, neutral contrast extending into the bowel wall then uh, circulations circulations are broad based outpouchings along the anti mesenteric border as a result of shortening along the mesenteric border to inflammation and fibrosis so along the mesenteric border is where we see the inflammation fibrosis as a result of which it shortens and the anti mesenteric border forms a circulation sinus tracts sinus tracts are blind ending tract that extends beyond the bowel wall serosa but does not reach the adjacent organs or skin then there are the fistulas fistulas can be simple or complex fistulas Simple fistulas are single extraenteric tract that connects the bowel lumen to another epithelialized surface. It can be endroenteric, endrocolic, endrovesical, endrocutaneous, or rectovaginal. In complex fistula, presence of more than one fistulous tract can result in asterisk or clover leaf appearance. Here you can see the asterisk appearance because multiple bowel loops are involved. inflammatory mass dense mesenteric inflammation without a well defined fluid component or discrete wall which occurs adjacent to an segment or an abscess this with a fluid collection with rim enhancement can occur and can occur in the mesentery peritoneal cavity peritoneum body wall perirectal or perianal region the mesenteric findings are very enteric edema so adjacent to the inflamed bowel loop we can see a hypodensity this is very enteric edema hmm? and goes vasa recti so also called comb sign here the vasa recti you can see a uh, prominent and they are forming a comb like appearance this is called a comb sign then fibrofatty proliferation then there can be thrombosis of the veins and lymphadenopathy yeah so good uh, so uh, nicely uh, showed the you know good uh, overview of uh, the different uh, imaging findings in the uh, uh, you know inflammatory bowel disease especially ulcerative colitis and uh, we should know how to differentiate ulcerative colitis from tb yes thank you ashwin you can stop sharing your juhu you thank can start you, thank you uh, so the important uh, teaching points uh, from this case is uh, you know uh, you should know the how to differentiate uh, uh, the tb from inflammatory bowel disease uh, the crohn's versus ulcerative colitis uh, as well as the different imaging features of uh, the crohn's disease yes dr juhu can you start yes yeah so uh, i request everyone to you know uh, read about uh, these things and uh, the different imaging findings not only the ct findings and the conventional barium Uh, meal uh, follow through findings also is very important and the uh, different complications uh, as well as the extra uh, 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 intestinal man- manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease uh, like uh, you know biliary findings so all those things are very very critical okay yes do you can start can you unmute yes uh 
this is a case of familial adenomatous polyposis. 22 year old male uh, with non case of familial adenomatous polyposis. Initially, he presented at the age of nine with rectal bleeding, and father had history of FAP with the uh, ear rectum. Colonoscopy at the age of 17 revealed hundreds of variable sized pedunculated and sessile polyps from rectum to cecum. Total proctocolectomy with ileal, uh, ileal pouch anal anastomosis was recommended. This is the axial contrast CT of abdomen uh, showing multiple pedunculated and sessile polypoidal lesions rising from the colonic wall. No features of extra mural involvement, uh, pedipolic fat involvement. Okay. No arrows and the sodi lesions. Hmm. Yes, sir. These are all uh, polypoidal lesions arising from the colonic wall. And the lesion here is a uh, large pedangulated soft tissue homogeneously enhancing, staining the distal rectum. But the pedipolic fat is clear. No mesopolic uh, lymph node involvement, no distal metastasis to the uh, liver or omentum peritoneum. Yeah, so basically uh, our uh, CT shows uh, multiple uh, uh, filling defects, soft tissue lesions, uh, polypoidal lesions uh, uh, most throughout the uh, colon, uh, but uh, we are also seeing a large mass you know, involving the uh, uh, rectum and the uh, sigmoid region. Uh, okay. Yes. So, what is the possibility of that big mass? Uh, that is a large uh, wall thickening noted in the uh, rectum. Uh, it can be uh, an adenocarcinoma or it can be uh, a fecal matter or it can be metastasis uh, or it can be um, any pseudopolyps. Uh, so, yeah, saying so DD for the polyp. So, I asked about the, the large mass in, the, in this setting of the multiple polyposis, it is you know, likely to represent a malignant transformation. Yeah, malignant okay. transformation of a polyp. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, this is the CT finding, sir. Multiple colonic and rectal intraluminal polyps noted throughout the colon and rectum. Large polypoid mass being arising from the wall of rectum, showing homogeneous enhancement. No abnormal uh, mesorectal nodes, uh, no infiltration of perirectal pericolic fat, no evidence of hepatic or peritoneal metastasis. These are the CCT findings of uh, uh, familial uh, FAP syndrome. Uh, actually, CCT is useful for diagnosing and staging colonic carcinoma. Uh, polypoid lesions with the enhancing central stroke can be there. Colorectal cancers are often multiple. Uh, look for nodal peritoneal hepatic metastasis and also for the desmoid or mesenteric fibromatosis. Higher uh, desmoid tumors will be having higher attenuation than muscle. And if they are in the anterior abdominal wall, it will be sharply marginated and in mesentery will be ill defined. Uh, it runs in family. Entire colon and system can be involved. Multiple polyps arise fr from the glands of the large intestine. Polyps begin to develop in puberty. By uh, 30, a person can have hundreds to thousands of polyps, and mostly in the descending colon. Because there are so many, by 40, uh, uh, they make can get colorectal cancer and by 50 all will do yeah generally you know, any polyp uh, you know, has a small risk of uh, malignancy and uh, uh, the individual polyp the risk of malignancy is very low but uh, because these people uh, tend to develop uh, you know, hundreds of polyp so the overall incidence of malignancy is very high and uh, by the end of uh, 50 years it is almost 100% or people will develop a malignancy yes so the diagnosis of this condition is very very important at a very early stage okay 
Uh, polyps can be classified by its appearance. It can be flat. Uh, don't protrude into the lumen. Uh, flat again as the mucosa. Can be pedunculated. Protrude into the lumen. Attached to the wall by a stalk. And can be sessile. Protrude to the lumen. And base is attached to the mucosa. In this uh, sessile, one uh, will be having more malignant potential. Adenomatous polyps. Usually pedunculated or can be sessile and never be flat. Uh, it can be tubular venous or tubular or sessile. Neoplastic polyps are adenomatous. Non neoplastic polyps are hyperplastic or hamartomatous or inflammatory. Adenomatous polyps contain focus of dysplasia and represent the potential precursor to colon carcinoma. Symptoms, usually if it is big enough to obstruct intestine, then abdominal pain, constipation, sometimes can ulcerate and cause GI bleeding and iron deficiency anemia. General features, hundreds or thousands of polyps can, can carpet the colon, adenomas, small and usually sessile. Extracolonic GI tract manifestations are very common, uh, can involve stomach, fundic gland polyp, and adenomas, then can involve duodenum. Adenomas in second part of uh, duodenum can uh, lead to periambulary carcinoma, and the periambulary cancer is the second most frequent site of cancer outside the colon. Can involve jejunum, ileum, then pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, there is an increased incidence of malignant CNS tumors, soft tissue tumors like desmoid at the surgical site, and osteoma. Yeah, so this yeah, slide again, uh, yeah, very, very important uh, slide to you know, remember. Because when you say familial adenomatous polyposis, it is not a, a single disease entity, it is a, you know, basically a syndrome and uh, these people are prone to develop uh, the uh, not only uh, lesions in the colon and uh, extracolonic uh, malignancy uh, including the, uh, the periampulary malignancy is very, very important. Uh, thing and uh, they can develop multiple osteomas and uh, this congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium also is uh, uh, one of the finding which has been described and uh, the, the it can occur in the uh, non FAP syndrome also but when it is bilateral and extensive uh, congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium uh, then uh, that is one of the feature of uh, familial adenomatous polyposis. So, you should know all those things and of course, the desmoid tumors are you know, relatively common in this uh, entity because this can be a you know, common exam uh, uh, paper. So, you should be able to describe all these findings. Okay. Yes, next. Gardner syndrome, it is the association of colonic adenomatous polyposis with the osteoma and soft tissue tumors like epidermoid cyst, fibroma and desmoid tumors. Percot syndrome. If the polyps are associated with medulloblastoma, congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigmented epithelium and GBM, glioblastoma multiforme. Radiographic findings. Fluoroscopic guided double contrast barium enema. Uh, innumerable variably sized radiolucent filling defects can be seen in colon. It carpets NDR colon, especially rectosigmoid region. Maybe widely scattered throughout, uh, widely scattered radiolucencies. Double contrast upper GI, small bubble, multiple small filling defects can be seen in the stomach, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Yeah, again, very important. Uh, this is uh, uh, you know the how to do a double contrast barium enema. When you are suspecting a uh, colonic uh, polyps, uh, you know, this is a uh, one uh, very very important investigation. Uh, and uh, old time examiners usually bring this type of uh, double contrast barium enema films and uh, you should be able to uh, na, diagnose and the technique of doing a na, double contrast barium enema also is very important. So, please go and read how to do the double contrast barium enema. Okay, next. Differential diagnosis of polyposis. It can be retained uh, feces and pool. Uh, filling defect in barium pool mimicking polyps can be uh, lymphoid hyperplasia, 
lymphoid follicles, aggregates of lymphocytes in muscularis mucosae, uh, seen in 50% of barium studies in children and 13% in adults, usually more prominent in the right colon and distal small bubble. Metastasis and lymphoma, rarely um, as numerous as lesions in FAP. FAP is more common. Metastasis, uh, malignant melanoma, breast, lung, meds. Uh, there will be smooth uh, polypoidal submucosal lesions of different sizes, seen as filling defects that can mimic uh, polyps. The lymphoma, uh, distribution of lymphoma more in stomach, uh, then small bubble, uh, then colon and esophagus. Pseudopolyps. Pseudopolyps as a result of ulcerative colitis, uh, granulomatous colitis, two types. Inflammatory pseudopolyps. These are the islands of elevated inflamed edematous mucosa that are surrounded by ulcerations. This appears as pseudopolyps, represent remnants of pre-existing mucosa and submucosa rather than any new growth. Post-inflammatory uh, pseudopolyps, uh, these are actually mucosal overgrowth. The regenerated mucosa results in uh, polypoidal lesions. This appears like a long filiform or brush-like structures simulating villus adioma may be small and rounded. Uh, these are seen during the healing phase. So, post-inflammatory pseudopolyps. Diagnosis. Colonoscopy is the diagnostic. Colonoscopy guided biopsy. Then, uh, fecal occult blood testing for GI bleeding. Then, genetic testing. Treatment, prophylactic colectomy. Remove uh, part of colon uh, without adenomas before they evolve into carcinoma. Often times, entire colon has to be removed. Other rare polyposis syndromes that occur less frequently than FAPs are uh, Pitts Jagger syndrome, juvenile polyposis, Cronkite Canada syndrome, Banyan Traile Rubelkaba syndrome. Hamartomatous polyposis syndrome. Hamartoma implies a non neoplastic tumor composed of normal tissue elements at the normal site. Hamartomatous polyps can coexist with adenomatous polyps, explaining the association of adenocarcinoma in most of these hamartomatous syndromes. Juvenile polyposis syndrome it is an autosomal dominant condition. Mm, with mutation of smart smart for g uh, hamartomas uh, uh, also have high risk of developing colon cancer can be associated with the adenomatous polyps and uh, we should do a regular endoscopic uh, follow up monitoring and sometimes prophylactic surgery with stegel syndrome it is caused by the mutation of stk11 gene characterized by multiple hamartomas in the gi tract Along with polyposis, there can be melanotic macules in the skin and mucosa. There is increased risk of cancer in GI tract, pancreas, breast, lungs, ovaries, and uterus, testicles. Yeah, so that's a very nice uh, presentation, Jogo, very nice uh, cartoons. Uh, so basically, uh, this case uh, uh, no, summarizes uh, the importance of learning the uh, different imaging features and uh, more importantly the associations of the you know, familial adenomatous polyposis. So, it is not, not enough if you just looking at the uh, colon alone and uh, also you should know what is uh, virtual uh, colonoscopy uh, you know, by using a CT. Uh, if you can uh, do the uh, you know, air encephalation and if you can uh, remove the all the fecal matter and uh, so you can almost get a, a, a colonoscopy like picture so that is called the virtual colonoscopy so that is again very very useful thing and uh, the uh, treatment you should know so once you diagnose uh, you know, family adenomatous polyposis and uh, the um, if you start seeing the polyps in the uh, colon even if it is not uh, malignant the treatment of choice will be uh, proctocolectomy because eventually most of the you know, adults will going to develop a malignancy. So, that is the treatment of choice and you should know the different uh, syndromes associated with the uh, polyposis uh, coli. Okay, so, with that I thank all the PGs as well as I thank the IRIA for uh, giving us the opportunity to present these cases as well as I thank the MedPiper team especially uh, Saumya. Yes sir, Venu sir. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. 
I, I think uh, we could finish time now <laughs> before eight o'clock. And just uh, uh, one, 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 two, two points now. Uh, to just uh, I would like to ask Dr. Juhu. Yes, sir. So it's a, uh, it's a polyp now. So you can yeah. demonstrate polyp in single contrast barium. You can demonstrate polyp in double contrast barium. Uh, and also you can demonstrate polyp in CT. Okay. Okay. So how will you define the polyp in each model, in each imaging? So suppose you are, uh, how to say, or how you can demonstrate a polyp in single contrast barium enema? Uh, single contrast barium enema can show filling defects. Uh, filling defect, uh, good. Is, yeah, yeah, filling yeah. defect. So you have to say filling defect, multiple, uh, either simple filling defect or multiple filling defects, as the case may uh, be, in uh, single contrast. In double contrast? Double contrast actually, uh, bowlers had sign. Uh, it can uh, cause uh, uh, radiolucency, double ring radiolucency, uh, with the dome uh, of the hat that is projecting into the lumen, uh, mm -hmm. which represent the polyp, and the base uh, of base that is the double ring that can represent the stalk of this polyp. So uh, in end phase uh, imaging, uh, this is how we diagnose. And in lateral, uh, we can differentiate it from uh, uh, we, uh, if it is projecting into the lumen, then it will lumen, be a yeah. poly. Yeah. Uh, and it, the dome is actually lined by barium. Dome is lined yes, by sir. barium. Yeah, it uh, is protruding into the lumen. That is a protrusion that you can appreciate in there. there is no filling defect in double contrast barium anima now. Ah, uh, sir. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, that is a point. And about, what about in CT? In CT, there will be uh, homogeneously enhancing multiple polyporal lesions arising from the wall. No, 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 multiple. Uh, no, I don't know it is, whether it is polyp or not. How can you, in what way actually you can define a polyp? You cannot say multiple polyporal lesions. Uh, so okay. just I want to define the polyp now. Uh, multiple CT. homogeneous CT. filling. Um, Single or multiple. Um, okay. Yeah. Filling defects. Arising from the walls. So there is no filling defect in CT. Uh, sorry, sir. Homogeneously uh, yeah. enhancing soft tissue. Unless there is uh, uh, contrast. Or soft yeah. tissue lesions. Or uh, there you can filling. say uh, soft tissue dense lesions. So well circumscribed, small, uh, round, spherical, or oval shape, whatever it is. So, uh, soft tissue dense masses, well circumscribed soft tissue dense masses protruding uh, into the lumen. Okay. Consistent with polyps. Okay. okay. Maybe ah. highly enhancing. Yeah, that's fine. And this is just one more thing. Just a uh, short one picture now uh, in familial adenomatous polyposis. Father, mother, and two children. So there ah. is high chance for uh, familial occurrence, no? familial incidence of um, uh, polyps now in okay. FAP. Yeah. Ah. So in that in that picture, you also showed one um, domestic dog. Uh, so even you you want to you, you, you want to mean no, that sir, I, this can, I mean even the dog can develop FAP. No, sir. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, very much. And uh, Doctor okay, Ashwin, sir. actually you uh, demonstrated all the findings, all the findings of Crohn's disease. And uh, yes, also sir. in simple way, um, in understandable way. Um, so this is how actually you have to tell. You say you have to say the findings now. So which all uh, the findings in Crohn's disease. So whether it is present or not. Okay. So if you know that this is Crohn's, then actually you are you are supposed to tell all the findings. Either uh, present findings or even if the findings are not there. You have to tell, okay, so this addition is not there or there is no structure. So that you beautifully narrated. Uh, that's good. And one, uh, Dr. Prashant, um, what I feel actually your presentation, in your presentation actually you are very confident. Confidently you presented, that's good. And only one point, um, uh, two points. So that is when you see lucency in the Hemithorax, no. Common things you should tell first. Common thing. 
so what are the common things that you can encounter what is the one is the hydrogen pericardiophrenic fat okay yeah cardiac anyway it's the fat containing lesion yes so pericardiophrenic fat number 1 sometimes in some uh, people know the the pericardiophrenic can get increased so that can produce lucency in the right lower zone area so that is one the commonest one and second is omental hernia okay again that is fat containing because omental contains fat so omental hernia that is morgagni hernia and third thing teratoma fat containing teratoma okay so uh, the other uh, this angiosarcoma angiolipocytoma of liver and then uh, fat containing uh, hcc all this can happen but in how many cases actually these are producing uh, lucent areas in hemithorax okay so very very rare so this the three things no first you have to say the three uh, uh, pleuropericardial fat second uh, omental hernia and third teratoma okay and uh, and also what are the another thing in lung window you short lung window ah yes okay ct ct lung window there you said Uh, air is there and also soft tissue density is there so there is a level between air and the soft tissue okay so when you show lung window uh, actually you are not, we are not supposed to say soft tissue yes see the thing is said soft tissue or fat or whatever it is or even fluid all this produce the same appearance in lung window no only in the mediastinal window you can say soft tissue yes. whereas in lung window as in x ray you have to say opacity what you are seeing is only opacity so that is why in lung window you are, we, are, we are telling like particular nodular opacities okay or pulmonary opacities uh, only in mediastinal window we can say that this soft tissue dense nodules so lung window is as uh, the appearance is the same as that of chest x ray chest x ray we are uh, telling only the opacities now in chest x ray only opacities are there or bones are there or lucencies are there that's all similarly in ct lung am i right dr rajesh ha ah, yes sir Yeah, yeah. yeah so in that case you can say that air opacity air is there in the non dependent part opacity is there in the dependent part but once you turn to mediastinal window you can say that okay this is soft tissue okay so you find and you all, all of you presented well with confidence and also uh, i think all these are actually exam cases all these are exam cases omental uh, morgagni hernia crohn's disease uh invariably crohn's disease will be there in exam long case and then familial adenomatous polyps okay thank you very much thank you dr rajesh actually uh, for selecting cases and all and also the residents also performed well thank you very much yeah thank you thank you sir and uh, you rightly you uh, know pointed out uh, the few important things so generally residents will uh, read the textbooks and uh, when you ask any uh, causes they usually come up with the 10 different uh, causes uh, which may be a uh, bit rare but uh, what is important is when you are attending these type of meetings only you know what is common that is what uh, uh, in the daily practice going to be very helpful so i request all the you uh, know residents to get benefited by this type of uh, uh, the presentations uh, done by the uh, you know faculties yeah that uh, will uh, conclude the session sir yes uh, thank you okay. thank you okay. thank yes you. Yes, so yeah, we can uh, conclude it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining today.